A simple way to navigate is to follow a line or follow a wall. We will study the controller that provides steering and velocity inputs to your car. For smooth maneuvering, the question is how does the controller decide to steer and how does it decide at what speed to drive? While you may be familiar with PID control in general, we will discuss how to use it effectively in the F110, both in simulation and on the real race car. As always, this course is a team effort with contributions from a variety of individuals. We're grateful for learning from each other. We will approach today's problem of designing a vehicle's controller in three parts. First, we just get the basic idea of what it means to track a reference signal and how to set it up mathematically. Then we use that as an input to the PID control for wall following. And we construct the basic equation for that and understand the mathematical formulation uh, with the P and the I and the D aspects. And finally, we apply this to the F110 race car and we implement this in ROS uh, in the simulator. And then once it works in the simulator, we implement it on the real vehicle. We also learn how to actually tune the PID control on the real vehicle using the electronic speed controller. Learning to drive <clears throat> and, and basically tracking a reference signal of going straight along a road is no different than what you know, we do as we drive on the road. We control the throttle and the steering. And so as we learn to drive along a certain line, we have to figure out how much to steer and how much to counter steer. And effectively tuning the steering of this and, and speed control is crucial for good performance. And eventually we get a very smooth controller without overshoots and one that converges very well. So what we will eventually get once we finish this lecture and complete the lab associated with this lecture is that we will have our first race and you will learn to race with just wall following. That's the first way we will actually have a competition and so we will get you to drive this car around the track without collisions, without crashes into the walls. And as part of that, you will learn the basics of PID, how to compete, uh, compute errors and failure modes. And in the assignment, you will actually do this in simulation, and then you will actually implement this on the real vehicle. So let's get started with tracking a reference signal. For systems with no dynamics or stability constraints, we can use simple open loop controllers, which directly input the desired response without continuous observation of the system state. However, for systems with dynamics, we use a feedback controller. A feedback controller continuously calculates the error value as the difference between the desired output response, which we shall call the set point, and a measured process variable, which is the actual output. We want a controller that automatically applies an accurate and responsive correction to the control function, say for maintaining the desired speed. And we wanted to do that with minimal delay and with minimal overshoot by increasing the output power of the engine in a smooth manner. So in our race car, we have a high level control reference. Say we want to drive the wheels at 60 rotations per minute or 60 RPM. This needs to translate to a low level control reference for the electric motor on the car. The electronic speed controller, which is a, a, a unit on the car, this maps this high level reference of the RPM to a low level reference in terms of the duty cycle for the pulse width modulation that's powering the motor. And essentially the faster we want to go, the higher the duty cycle it maintains. And this PWM signal on, on the motor affects the motor's armature current and increases or decreases the throttle appropriately. As the armature current starts to settle, once we have driven this, uh, um, this vehicle out of the start position, the motor speed settles to around 60 RPM. And here we can see in the green, we are basically trying to track this reference signal of the motor speed. And in order to do that, we have to maintain this armature current around this, uh, this, this area on the graph. 
Later in this lecture, we will learn how to configure the electronic speed controller. So from our programmer interface, we only deal with the high level control objectives of velocity and orientation and the low level PWM aspects are taken care of by the electronic speed controller. Our main goal in this lab is to maintain a distance from the wall. For this, we need to control the steering angle, assuming that we are going at a fixed velocity. Uh, we are only focusing first on what steering angle we need to control or, and maintain. So our controller needs to convert the current distance to a steering angle. And with each update, the controller outputs a new steering angle. But instead of updating and, and inputting a steering angle, in feedback control, we input the error between the reference signal and our current state. The rest of this lecture is focused on formulating the appropriate error term and using a controller to drive this error term to zero. The algorithm that provides steering and acceleration inputs is proportional integral derivative control or PID. PID is very pop, a very popular and versatile controller. It, uh, uh, its appeal lies in its simplicity and of course the results it achieves. It is a controller you can get out of the box with the autonomous race car we use in this course. Feel free to replace it with something better. Say for example, a model predictive controller. I'm sure you'll find something better. Let's set up the scene. The car is driving down the hallway. There are two control goals. First, drive along the center line as shown in the dashed line. And second, stay parallel to the walls. Note that these two objectives are not redundant. The car can drive parallel to the walls as e on either side of the center line or some distance away from the center line, but not be on the center line over here. And, and it can drive roughly along the center line, but not always parallel to the walls. And here we see that we would want to steer the vehicle as it keeps deviating from the center line, but when it is steering, it's not remaining parallel. So mathematically, we express these two objectives as follows. First, define the global reference frame as shown at the bottom over here with the X and the Y axis. The origin is on the center line. As we learned in our previous lecture that we are using uh, the RGB or XYZ axis and the vehicle's orientation is along the X axis. So define the angle theta as the angle formed by the car and the X axis over here. So driving along the center line is expressed as y equals zero, which means we're exactly on the center line and driving aligned with the walls is expressed as theta equals zero. That means we have no deviation from the center line. But we do expect that the car will deviate from the center line. So we restate the second objective as follows. Now you can follow on the figure over here, if the car keeps driving at a current angle for another L meters, it will be at some point down the road ahead. If it drives straight ahead, parallel to the wall for another L meters, it will be at some other point. The distance between these two points is L sine theta. We want this difference minimized. This, this gives the car some leeway to come back to the center in L meters and therefore reduces the jerk in the motion. So we're not trying to correct it right away, but we're gonna correct it over the course of L meters. If you reduce L, you require some more severe constraint for the control behavior and will result in more jerkiness. And if you have L that is too long, then you will converge very slowly to the center line. So for our car, we use L equals 1.5 meters. So what do we control? We control the steering angle theta and we simply hold the velocity constant. This is suboptimal, but it works for now because we are operating at a very uh, fast update rate. So now let's see how we get to do this with PID. The first step in PID is to define the error term. In this case, it simply means minus the sum of y, the distance from the center line, and L sine theta, the difference between the destination of driving straight and, um, uh, and, and driving at the current angle theta. This term is zero when the car is at the center line and aligned with the walls. The reason we have a minus sign will be clear shortly. The control objective can be expressed as 
we want to drive this error to zero. So let's see how we drive this error to zero. So if Y is positive, meaning that the car is to the left of the center line, we want to steer right, have a negative theta. And if L sine theta is greater than zero, uh, we will be pointed left in L meters. So again, we want to steer right with a negative theta. It is reasonable therefore to set the desired theta angle to a positive multiple of the error as shown over here. It is trivial to verify that this achieves a behavior as we described. So therefore this negation over here is essentially the desired direction that is in opposition of where we currently are. And that's why we have this negation for the, for the, uh, the, the steering angle terms. In case where the car is to the left as shown where Y and sine theta are negative, you saw the correct, we see the same thing follows. So the correction term will be a, a negation of a negative number, which is positive because we're going to now go left and then say Y is positive, but L sine theta is negative. Then there's a trade-off between the need to steer right and the need to steer left. This form of control where the control input is proportional to an error term is called unsurprisingly proportional control. And that's the P and the PID. We further multiply a constant C to scale the distances on the right side of the equality to the angles on the left side. And this C depends really on, you know, your cornering stiffness and also the size of the vehicles, the separation of the wheels and what the Ackermann steering uh, parameters are. A high proportional gain results in a large change in the output for a given change in the error. If the proportional gain is too high, the system can become unstable. In contrast, as we see here, a small gain results in a small output response to a large input error and a less responsive or less sensitive controller. So here we're gonna start with a, a P gain of five. And, and this is a smaller gain than necessary. If the proportional gain is too low, like in this case, the control action may be too small when responding to the control system disturbances. So here we can see that the, the car was under proportional gain control of KP. The car started slightly off center with Y uh, positive pointing to the left with L sine theta positive. And we can see that the car's distance from the center line is large owing to a smaller correction applied to the same error. And it starts to oscillate around the center line and eventually it settles down uh, to that basically undoing the original disturbance of being off-centered and misaligned. Uh, but this takes quite a while to settle down and there are quite a few overshoots in the opposite direction too. So, so we call this the, uh, a cross-track error. So in summary, the P controller improves the steady state accuracy by decreasing the steady state error. And the steady state error is defined as the difference between the input, the command, and the output of the system in the limit as time goes to infinity. Now, if we are driving at a fixed velocity V, instead of fixing the steering angle towards the reference line, we define a variable we call the cross track error defined as the reference signal minus the output signal. This measuring the distance from the center of mass of gravity uh, of our car to our reference line or the line we want to drive at the steering of the car must be in proportion to this cross-track error. When the error is large, the large, the large uh, is larger, the larger is the applied input to correct it. Which means that if we have to take, uh, if we have a high cross-track error, then we have a high steering angle uh, for which we are correcting towards. A small cross-track error, uh, error will result in a small steering adjustment. And the control input that we generate U from time T is what we multiply with our cross-track error. With the gain variable of Kp, uh, and this is the magic behind uh, proportional control. The main drawback of, proportion, of the P controller is that it results in offsets in the system. A larger proportional gain also increases the maximum overshoot of the system to the right or to the left of this center line. What we want is a way to notice that the error is reducing over time and hence the corrective action should also reduce. And if we predict the error is reducing, 
then we apply an early corrective action that is proportional to the rate at which the error is reducing. A simple prediction is to apply a derivative gain based on the error. With, with the new term, the car will now counter steer and approach the center line much more smoothly. So as we see in the figure at the bottom, we are counter steering initially and then coming to a smooth and almost asymptotic uh, approach to the center line. And we, are, we don't have any cross track error in terms of going on the other side of the center line. So proportional control follows the error's current value and not how fast it's changing. If the error term increases quickly, you might want to introduce uh, corrections that also correct quickly. This is where derivative control comes in. In derivative control, we add a term that is proportional to the error derivative as shown here. Now the steering angle reacts to how fast or how slow the error is increasing or indeed decreasing. Derivative control predicts the system behavior and thus improves the settling time and the stability of the system. The derivative controller is effectively seeking to reduce the effect of this set point minus the, 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 the value of uh, the, the P controller's error by exerting a control influence generated by the rate of the error change. In some ways, it counters the P controller's influence and helps reduce this overshoot. In the scenario, you can see here, the car is to the left of the center line, so Y is positive and the negative KPY term will be negative. So steer right. So Y is decreasing. And so Y prime, the derivative of Y is negative and the theta is negative pointing to the right. So the error derivative term, negative Y prime minus L cos theta, because we took the derivative of sine theta is therefore positive. So steer left. So that's in the other direction. So it's counter steering, right? So the effect of these two conflicting commands is to smoothen out the error as it takes longer to come, but it takes longer to come back to the center and the trajectory is becomes smoother. So, and we do not overshoot in this case. So we see that the, the derivative controller is actually in some sense countering a very large P control as the rate of the error starts to decrease. To improve the tracking, we decrease, we increase the P gain now on the car, and we also have a, a KD term to reduce the overshoot. So let's take a look at how this works. So out of the car, the race car implements a PD control with KP as 14 and KD as 0 0.09. And here you can see that the car very smoothly actually starts to follow the center line with very minimal overshoot and settles also rather quickly. And Later, as it goes down the hallway, it's pretty much steadily on this red center line. And this is where we want to get to with uh, our tuning of the controller. Now, every car is going to vary. The car that you will get in, in, in the course will also have different values, but so you'll have to learn to tune that. Finally, one can, one can include an integral gain term, which is proportional to the cumulative error for some reference time t over here. So imagine as you drive a car, you know, and your normal steering mode leads you to a trajectory that is actually away from your goal. So there is some error that is still, you know, residual that is still there even after you have done your corrective action. So you realize that over an interval of interval of time that you can't get closer to your goal. So you need to steer more and adjust to this bias of where the st steering is actually heading that way. This happens sometimes like if you have a, a flat tire or a less inflated tire on one side and your car starts to veer, you know, say to the left side. So, so then you have to counter steer and you have to basically uh, adjust for this bias because of the different inflation of the wheels. So what do you need for that? You need a sustained situation of large error. This means that measure the integral of the cross stack error over time. And so now the contribution from this integral term is proportional to both the magnitude of the error and the duration of this error. So the integral term in a PID controller is a sum of the instantaneous error over time and gives the accumulated offset that should have been corrected previously. So this is correcting this kind of bias that you know, the, the P controller cannot uh, take care of because there is a systemic bias in the, in the plant. 
The accumulated error is then multiplied by the integral gain and added to the controller input. And this now also compensates for what the P controller cannot do. So now let's look at how we can tune this, but we will add, uh, we will add in, our, in our case over here, uh, an integral control value of two. And as you can see what it does, the car basically just goes and crashes into the wall, right? And why does this happen, right? So this cumulative error essentially exploded and the integral control overcompensated dramatically. Well, this is because you know, the vehicle at this initial point over here has an error that, that it's pointing in the wrong direction, right? And therefore this projected error of where it's going to be in you know, L distance away is also large. So this error term initially was ca caused to explode. So the integrative gain is large and the, and the other P and D gains are not able to compensate for this behavior and the integral gain basically dominates over here. So that's not to say that integral control is bad period, right? Oh, only that this value of KI with this error definition goes poorly for the car. So it's badly tuned in this case, right? So, so following a large change in the set point, the integral term can accumulate an error, you know, larger than the maximal value uh, for the regulation variable, right? So thus the system overshoots and continues to increase until this accumulated error is basically unwound. So the problem can be addressed by you know, disabling the integration until the, you know, the, the, the vehicle has entered a controllable region and is you know, within this error margins of the, uh, the, the center line or preventing the integral term from accumulating above you know, uh, some uh, or below some predetermined bounds, right? So out of your box, the race car will have no integral control and you can see why. So in general, the proportional controller does most of the heavy lifting and the integral controller reduces the steady state residual error that still remains after the P controller has done its work. And the D controller counters the P controller to reduce the overshoot. And as you can see in the animation from Wikipedia here that initially we apply a P gain and that gets us close enough to our set point but we overshoot, then we apply an I gain that takes care of the residual error of the offset. And then we apply the D gain to basically essentially flatten out this and minimize the overshoot. All right, so eventually we will have our car that is tuned and it's very, it, and it basically converges very fast and uh, hopefully no one gets in your way as you drive down the corridor. So let's take a look at that once again as the tune car drives down. And this is what we want you to have by the end of the, for this current lab. All right, so just to summarize, you know, PID tuning is, is an example of model free control. We don't model the plant and therefore we have to rely on experience and analysis to tune these gains, right? A controller engineer needs to know what it can tolerate, what is unsafe, what biases are inherent in the system. So there are manual and heuristic approaches for tuning PIDs. In this course, since each vehicle is slightly different, we will manually tune your vehicle. Using common PID values, uh, we have built the F110 simulator to have similar dynamics and the similar and the right parameters. So with a smaller sim to real gap going from simulation to the real vehicle, the code that is developed in simulation can directly be used on the car. Uh, this simplifies your tuning effort and gives you a warm start. So you just have to tune it a little bit only, not continuously tune it over many hours on the car. So, so far we have a conceptual and a practical understanding of PID for wall following. Let's look at defining the actual error term. So we can use this in ROS and then on the real car. So we will now learn how to make our car run parallel to the wall at a fixed distance. Let's go through a simple procedure to calculate the distance of the wall from the car and then hence calculate the deviation from the desired trajectory. The LiDAR scans, as we learned before, scan from right to left, corresponding to you know, negative 135 degrees to positive 135 degrees, a total field of view of 270 degrees. For simplicity, let's identify a LiDAR ray that corresponds to zero degrees. That's just to the right of the car. And that's, uh, so when the car is parallel to the wall, it's just to the right, right? So we call that the zero degree ray. 
uh, for this case, right? It's not the zero degree ray for the LIDAR itself. Uh, so, so that's what we have on the right-hand side. We have selected one right LIDAR ray. So, but actually we need to pick two LIDAR rays, one at zero degrees and the other at theta, theta degrees being some angle between zero to 70 degrees. So essentially it's two rays that are pointing to the same side of the wall, same wall side, right? So let alpha be the orientation of the car with respect to the wall. So the car is basically tilted away uh, from, the, from the wall. So by solving this geometric problem, we can establish that you know, uh, alpha as tan inverse of A cos uh, theta minus B uh, divided by A sin theta. Uh, because we need to know what alpha is, right? So, and then and then, then we can figure out, okay, what is this distance AB? It is essentially B times cosine alpha. And uh, with some basic trigonometry, you can figure out how to get this uh, tan inverse of uh, alpha. And we can take those questions offline. So if the desired trajectory say is one meter from the wall, then generally the error that is controlled by the PID is one minus AB. But we cannot use this distance directly as this is the instantaneous error. I mean, we are racing the car due to the high speed of the car and a finite delay in execution. By the time we correct for this error, the car has already moved ahead. And now we need to basically keep following this error over here. So we will always be chasing this error and the car will start to oscillate in an unstable manner because our update is a little too late as the car has already moved to a new position. So how do we start to reason about this instantaneous error, right? So what we'll do is we'll just project the car forward, assuming that the car is going to continue in the same direction from its current, current position, right? So hence now the distance of the car from the wall becomes AB plus AC times sine uh, alpha, right? It's just that additional uh, dis uh, distance of uh, where we get CD now. Hence the error that to be compensated for is the difference between the future projected error, which is given by CD and the desired trajectory. Now we have the error and we can use it in the PID equation to determine the amount of correction to be given to the steering. Uh, and we are going to do that for uh, the, the, the predicted position of the vehicle. So the goal of the PID is to reduce this error to zero in the most efficient manner. So we use a standard PID equation where ET is the error term from the desired trajectory as seen in the lecture uh, so far, we've been only using KP and KD controls, right? Uh, we saw that the KI term just causes the vehicle to crash into the wall. Hence we implement this as you know, a tunable variable KP times the error plus another tunable variable KD times the difference in the error. Um, we use this to increment or decrement your steering angle. In practice, in the practice session, you'll be implementing this in code. In ROS, you'll implement two nodes, a node that uses the laser scans from the LiDAR to determine the distance from the wall, and then another node to apply PID to this error to determine the steering angle. And then we output that to the vehicle controller that, that then controls the vehicle's velocity and uh, the steering angle. So now let's learn how to drive straight in ROS. So in this section, we'll walk through an example skeleton code of how you would learn to drive straight. The actual code in your lab will differ slightly, but this is a good guide to get you familiar with implementation of driving along the center line in ROS. Now let's see the implementation details over here. So once you download the lab workspace and open the template Python find, you have uh, to complete two nodes, right? Distance finder, and the control uh, pi node. So essentially what we are doing in this lab is we are getting the sensor data uh, by subscribing to the LiDAR topic. And then we calculate the current and the projected error in the distance finder node. And that outputs basically this error in the form of this PID input. And that is sent to the, the control node to compute the PID. And then the control node basically uh, outputs the command of what is the angle, steering angle and the velocity for the vehicle and sends that to the, the, the node that is already set up to control the vehicle. So the distance in the distance finder, you need to 
complete two functions, get range and callback. This node subscribes to the LiDAR scan data of type laser scan and publishes a PID error of custom data type called PID input. And also <clears throat> publish, so, so, and we also publish now this PID input to any topic that would subscribe to it. So the laser scan is a standard sensor messages data type with various fields. The field ranges, which is an array consisting of the distances and meters with first element being the distance at angle min and the last element being the distance at the angle max. And the intermediate values are at increments of the angle increment, right? And we're going through uh, 10, uh, 1080 uh, increments uh, over uh, a span of 270 degrees. So the PID, uh, in the PID input message consists of two data elements. First is a PID error, or the error that needs to be compensated by the PID. Uh, and, and then the PID velocity, which is the velocity of the car that the car should move at, right? So, so we'll focus mostly on the steering and we'll later see how this velocity error is updated based on the steering angle. So the callback is the function that is called when a new message arrives from the laser scan topic. So uh, let's fill this up, right? So the first step is to get two rays on the right side of the car to determine the distance of the car from the right wall and the orientation with respect to it. So we pick two rays at zero degrees and theta degrees, which is about say 70 degrees uh, from the, the zero degree ray of the LiDAR scans. So complete the get range function that determines the distance of the wall at angle theta using the data. The various elements of the scan data can be accessed like a structure using the dot operator. Now, using the equations provided in the tutorial, implement the callback function in the space provided. Uh, keep the speed of the car constant for now, uh, and then check the error by physically moving the car close to or away from the wall at different orientations. Right? So, so essentially, in this callback function, you have pick two rays on the right side, you know, specify the correct index of the ray in the range of zero to uh, the length of this range is minus one, that's the maximum. And so essentially you're picking this uh, ray at zero degrees and then at about 30, 70 degrees away from the zero degrees, right? And this basically we then, you know, obtain this A and B values as the two, uh, at the two angles by calling get ranges, right? So then we can calculate alpha, A, B, C, D using A, B and theta as we saw in the earlier equation, right? And then we calculate this error uh, based on you know the future distance CD and what is the desired trajectory, right? So, and then we construct this PID input message where we put in the error, uh, the steering angle error and the velocity and publish this message. So now complete the get ranges function, you know, that uh, as we can see over here, that takes the input of the receive scan data at this angle and then outputs the distance away, right? So, so essentially using these equations provided in the tutorial, we implement this callback uh, function. So now let's implement the PID node named as control pi, right? In the same source folder. This node takes the error message of type or data type PID input published by the distance finder and publishes the drive parameters of the custom message type, you know, drive param. And that's the output of this node. So drive param type consists of two fields, the angle specifying the steering angle between negative 100, 200, and the velocity specifying the throttle between negative 100 to 100 over there. And so essentially this is now within this fixed range and we are essentially discretizing it and mapping it to this range. So the main function at startup requests for KP, KD and velocity values, and this makes it easier to tune the PID. So control is a callback function <clears throat> that needs to be filled with the PID equations. The variable servo offset is used to trim the steering angle of the car to the center position. Uh, if there is any kind of misalignment and, and you will always have some misalignment with the front wheels. And so basically follow these three steps now, right? So first amplify the error by some suitable value. Um, and this is uh, besides the, the uh, KP value and then apply the PID equation to determine the correction value to the servo. Be sure to also consider the servo offset. Right? So finally, do check to see if the steering angle is within these bounds of negative 100 to positive 100. 
So now you must be able to run your car by executing the following nodes, right? So, so first you run ROS core, and then you run, uh, and that basically initializes ROS. And you uh, call ROS run, Hokuyu node, uh, and this, this is basically a node to obtain the laser data. And then we call ROS run race control pi, that's the PID node, and then ROS run race, uh, and then the distance finder pi, and this node to process the sensor data. So we would encourage you to write a launch file to ease the process to call all of these you know, in, a, in a script. And then you can refer to the accompanying lab guide for more information on launch files. Similarly, now so far we have fully focused on you know, the PID control for the steering angle. For the velocity, essentially, you, have, you also use the steering uh, and the error of the steering angle as an input. So basically, on the straight parts of the track, when the car is parallel to the wall and the error is low, the car drives at a higher velocity, say 1.5 meters per second. But during turns, when the error is high, the velocity of the car reduces appropriately, maybe down to 0.5 meters per second. So, and, and so essentially the velocity is the fun as a function of the error value. And that corresponds very well to when we are very confident in driving along the center line versus when we need to slow down along a turn and we could be deviating from the center line. So now we need to tune these PID values <clears throat> on the actual vehicle using the electronic speed controller. As you can see in the video here, we have mounted the vehicle at a certain height so it doesn't drive off the table. And now we can test for, you know, with using a joystick controller, we can test for both the, the velocity of the vehicle and the steering angle, right? So, but this motor controller, it needs tuning and it needs to, you need to know how to tune this for real. So what we do have on the vehicle is what is called a VESC or you know, a, an electronic speed controller, which comes with a very good software called the VESC tool. And this gives us the ability to connect our computer with the motor controller to configure and tune the motor controller. And this is a very popular motor control actually, and it's used in a lot of electric skateboards. Instead of connecting ROS to the race car's electronic speed controller via low level PWM signals, the VESC allows a ROS to just specify the velocity and the heading and it's much easier to use, right? So essentially after the firmware update uh, that we give you, uh, select load motor configuration XML from the drop down menu and select the provided XML file, which we will give you, right? So that's essentially the configuration. After the XML file is uploaded, click on the right motor configuration button. The button <clears throat> with the down arrow and the letter M that's on the right-hand side of this image. Um, uh, and then you basically note that in future, you'll have to press this button whenever you make a change to the motor configuration. So essentially this XML file stores everything to do with how you want to configure your motor, both the steering and uh, the main drive motor. So now you can start tuning your PID control, right? To see the RPM response of the motor, navigate to the real-time uh, tab under data analysis on the left then click stream real-time data button on the right. The button is uh, you know, uh, with letters RT and then navigate to the RPM tab on the top of the screen and you should see the RPM data streaming now. And that's what we show were doing in the, in the previous video. So to create a step response of the motor, you can set a target RPM at the bottom of the screen. You know, it has values between say 2000 to 10,000, uh, click, the play button next to the text box to start the motor. So note that the motor will spin. So make sure the wheels of your car are clear or, or from any objects. So uh, click the anchor or the stop button to stop the motor. Uh, you want to look for the clean step response that has a quick rise time and zero to very little steady state error after that. So now you want to adjust the gains accordingly by navigating to the PID controllers tab under motor settings on the left and then change the speed controller gains. So general rules for tuning PID gains apply here. If you are seeing a lot of oscillations, try to uh, try changing the speed PID, K, the KD filter. So here are the key takeaways, right? So we first understood what it means to track a reference signal in terms of not just the instantaneous distance and the angle uh, from uh, the wall, uh, but the projected value over there. And then using that, for PD control for wall following, right? And then we learned how to do that in ROS 
so that it is easy to run in the simulator and then to use the same code to run in the car. And finally, we learned you know, how, how this uh, VESC electronic speed controller tool makes it easier to tune the motor controller on the car. So for your lab, what you will do is you will be following a wall and you need to complete two laps from the start position and essentially be able to drive your car without crashing into the walls uh, uh, and, and smoothly drive uh, uh, across these two laps. So this ends our lecture and now you are ready to drive your vehicle. So good luck. <laughs>